Hi, good evening. My name is uh, Bishar Fancy. Um, welcome to the webinar that Kips does uh, at least once a month, but this is a, a IT professional week, so we are doing a special event with Neil Hepburn from Price Waterhouse. Um, so in order to get the ball rolling, uh, I won't hold you up. I'm going to hand it over um, very quickly to uh, Neil so he can give you his background. Uh, but thank you very much for those who have taken time to attend today. And I hope you will find it worthwhile. So <coughs> I'll sign off and I'll come back. We will hopefully do Q&A. So stay put and we'll open the lines for everybody then to ask those questions. So thank you, gentlemen uh, and ladies. And I hand it over to Neil now. Yep. Um, can everyone hear me OK? Lucian, can you? Is the volume OK? Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Neil Hepburn. Um, before I get into this uh, presentation, I am from uh, PwC Canada. This is just a generic disclaimer, um, just to protect ourselves. Um, basically means if you follow the advice here and everything goes wrong, then you know you can't blame us, I suppose, if you didn't go through the consulting. But anyway, standard legal disclaimer, I'll move on. Uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Neil Hepburn. Um, I am uh, CDMP certified. That's a DAMA International uh, certification. If anyone's aware of DAMA, it's the largest uh, data management professionals organization. It's similar to KIPS in a lot of ways. Um, I have, uh, in terms of my academic background, I have a Bachelor of Mathematics and Computer Science from Waterloo. Um, and I've been in IT working with data for the past 20 years. Um, currently, and I've worked, by the way, for every everything from I've started up my own uh, software company a couple times. I've worked for s small software companies, uh, mid-size, um, very large corporations like Bell Canada and CGI, and now PricewaterhouseCoopers. And um, right now I'm working within PwC's uh, analytics and digital practice, and I am the, the go-to person, if you will, when it comes to sustainable agile analytics. Uh, my sort of elevator pitch really comes down to I can compress the time to deliver a sustainable business ana analytics solution, that is to say like a dashboard uh, with automated refreshes uh, in what would normally take months down to days. And that's not an exaggeration. These are testimonials I've received. So I've spoken in a number of other locations there. You can see I'm not going to read those to you. Um, so Agile Analytics, what do we mean by Agile Analytics? Because it's I have to be clear. It's uh, it w the way we're doing it is not um, the way I, I, I see it done in most other places. Not it's not a traditional sort of Scrum um, IT centric uh, approach. Um, it is um, really a system um, I would say uh, business facing system for time compressing dashboard development and data prep, or some some of you might call it ETL, um, compressing those iterations from months down to days. Uh, okay, so just uh, checking the camera there. Um, sustainable ag uh, uh, Agile Analytics, and by the way, I throw the word digital in there as well, just to kind of uh, distinguish. I mean, digital, by the way, for those of you who haven't heard, if, you, if you've ever heard of um, this, this concept of a digital business transformation, it really comes out of um, just a very quick history I'll just jump into. About 10, 15 years ago, marketing uh, departments started to um, put together uh, what was known as a digital channel to go along with their other um, advertising channels, such as television, radio, print, uh, and out of home. And what happened was the digital channel, um, in order to succeed on advertising in digital formats, such as online advertising like Google AdWords or DoubleClick or Facebook or even digital signage, um, they hired a lot of people from who had sort of a, a software background, so Silicon Valley types, if you will. And those people brought in agile methods, but they brought it into the business. So uh, consultants at McKinsey noticed this and um, began to see this as a sort of a new way of do doing business. So really, when you hear digital, digital transformation, really what it means is it's, it's really bringing agile methods to the business. So a sustainable digital or agile analytics, um, what that means is it's just a continuously improving secure and scalable system whose purpose is to reduce the elapsed time and effort to identify, obtain, and prep data for analysis and presentation. And at the cornerstone of all of this is something that I have invented 
um, called the Portable Data Lake System. And that is just a curation system based on folders and files that can be understood by humans and machines alike. So above all, the um, philosophy, if you will, uh, behind this, this Agile Linux is um, a Latin phrase that I love, uh, which is solvitur vivendo, which means it is solved by doing. Um, so often I will run into issues and I'll see, you know, uh, or rather I'll work with people who run into issues and, you know, consultants like to have prolonged conversations about things sometimes too long. Um, I am very quick to just start building things and see what happens. And it's amazing and it's really taken me incredibly far. So on that note, I'm just sorry, I'm trying to advance the, um, the slide here, Bashir, um, and just, it's not working for me here. Sorry. No, it's that, is that the button? Sorry, folks, we're just having a little technical yeah, I'm kind of hoping I can just press a single button. Okay. I'm just wondering if I want to go back. Okay, Okay. now it's working. All right, so um, how did I start with this stuff? Well, basically, I came to PwC in, in the fall of 2011 with this mandate to build out Agile Linux practice. And my approach has been um, very much in the weeds. Uh, so I've been doing, I, I've really lost count, to be honest with you at this point, uh, at least 30 proof of concepts. And um, I've really just uh, essentially been, for, for at least half of those, I've been the one that's sort of been building out the actual dashboards, the, the, the data prep, all that stuff on my own. So I have a real kind of, I can see exactly how this stuff is being used. I can see what outcomes it, it, it leads to. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in going down to the ground truth. I think you have to have a top down um, background. I think you have to have a theoretical background to be successful, but I think you also need to continuously be in those weeds to understand if that theory makes sense or not and how it needs to be tweaked. So I've also been um, intensely researching the Hadoop world, uh, both tinkering and um, talking to clients and um, uh, researching companies like Facebook that actually blog about how they use Hadoop. And uh, I've been actually able to, there's a lot of lessons in there that I've been able to ab apply to our own Business Intelligence Center of Excellence. And what I'll tell you is in all this four and a half years I've been doing this, there's a couple overarching lessons, and it's really just one lesson that I've learned, and it's the fact that there's, there's lack of data portability. The, the uh, uh, not being able to find and obtain data is really what kills off most initiatives, whether, whether people realize it or not. Um, I've come to the conclusion that data should be portable like money. Um, you should be able to go to a bank and take out your money. Everyone expects that. But with data, it's more like when you go to the bank, the bank is saying, hey, there's a little gift shop here and uh, you can buy this uh, toy if you want for your grandmother or your child or whoever. And um, uh, you know that's kind of how a lot of data works uh, in this day and age still, is, is you're kind of locked into this sort of very constrained environment. Um, so I, w for, for the rest of this presentation, I, I, I want to um, basically launch into what kind of findings we had and, and some of the patterns that have come out there. And I think there's some really valuable um, findings if you know what to look for. Um, and then I'm going to get into, you know, what we're actually, uh, how we're actually doing Agile Linux. And then I want to talk about the, the, the portable data lake system. So first of all, what we found is the reason why it seems a lot of the BI fails, and by the way, I say this why it dis I shouldn't say fail, but why it disappoints, because fail is a very strong word and it's actually not correct. Um, because we come in on the tailcoats of a lot of BI projects that did kind of disappoint. And the pattern we noticed there really comes back to um, three things. Uh, the feedback tends to be uh, missing or take too long before it's tested. So, um, uh, and the reason why that tends to happen is that um, it takes too long to obtain data, and I, I mentioned that just, just earlier. And there's, there's more time than I think is necessary uh, that tends to be spent on data modeling and data prep. So I'll notice people will start to build out full-fledged warehouses with you know, many different layers like landing layer and staging layer and integration layer and presentation layer and semantic layer and all the ETL and all that stuff. And then 12 months later, you know, you'll see that first report. And of course, it's exactly what they asked for, but not what they needed. So. Um, so you don't need to spend 12 months to get that feedback, and um, and that's kind of what I've been you know pushing around, pushing for. But I also think there's a lot of archaic methods out there as well, and I'll talk more about that. That also slow things down. 
Um, the other thing is, um, and this is possibly even more important, is the final product, the BLI as it's delivered right now, doesn't really give users the control that they need um, to produce the reports that can answer all their questions. And secondly, or thirdly, um, those users sometimes struggle to determine where the data was, was sourced from and what transformations it's gone through. So there's a kind of a trust issue sometimes um, with BI that can happen if, if it's not clear you know, where the data came from. So the, um, the biggest risk um, for any kind of BI project, and I've already sort of pointed this out, is identification of data and obtainment. Um, so, so locating the data that you need, um, it could be you know, transactions um, from some point of sale system, or it could be some HR records. It's, it, you, know, you know the data is there, but it can be really difficult to, to find a lot of the time. And there's really kind of two main causes for this. There is uh, what I refer to as is the intangible cause. And, and this, is, this is basically people who have no incentive to give you the data because they benefit from um, what, what's known as information asymmetry, for being that go-to person. Um, and it's really, you can't take intangible causes head on. Uh, you can only deal with tangible causes. So the, the, the tangible causes, the things that you can deal with, are um, a, what, I would, what I call a database bureaucracy. And that really means, and I'm going to dive into that in a second, but that really means that once you put data into a database, it's really hard to get it out for any sort of business um, ad hoc uh, querying. Um, and uh, by the way, if you can solve that database bureaucracy issue, um, the countervailing motivation issue starts to go away because once the data is easy to obtain um, for anyone, then it's harder to, um, then it doesn't, you don't really need these, these people as, as, as much to help you um, obtain and interpret the data. But there's other things uh, as well that I want to get into um, in a bit uh, regarding the countervailing motivations because I think that's a really important thing for people to understand. So why are databases, um, why do they create this bureaucracy? And what, it, what is this bureaucracy that I'm talking about? Um, sorry, I'm just going to take a sip of my coffee. So the main problem is this. It really comes down to the fact that um, the way that we do business intelligence and data warehousing is we will load a, um, a database um, with the data that we wish to report on. And then, uh, so it could be like an Oracle database or it could be Teradata, or SQL Server, MySQL, or even one of these um, you know, newfangled Hadoop systems that falls under this category as well. Like a Hive database or Impala, if you've heard of that. And uh, the problem is, is that um, they will be purpose-built for a business intelligence system. So it could be MicroStrategy or Microsoft or Oracle or Click or Tableau or whatever. And all the security, all the business security will be done essentially outside of that database. So you, the database has what's known as like a hard candy security model, which really means that if you can get into the database, it's sort of all or nothing. Um, so you'll have like um, an operational account, a BI account, or an ETL account, and then you'll have a DBA account that gets in the database. But there's no policy or thought towards, hey, what can we just let a business user go in there and, and, and um, look around? Uh, so there's no security po policy in there. So if you try to ask, ask for access to that database, it's, it's going to be really hard to get. And even if you do get security authorization, um, the DBA can still say no because they're bound to these service level agreements where if you write a query that's let's say a cross product join or something like that that overwhelms the database those guys get in big trouble and because uh, it can slow down the database so th people don't like it when you go into relational databases and start mucking around so th they're they're incredibly difficult to access now i know there's exceptions out there but the general rule i hate to say it is data within databases is basically off limits except for what you can get to through that, that very simplistic BI layer. Um, but let's say you do get access to the database. Let's, and that, I do get access uh, sometimes, because the nice thing about being um, an expensive consultant is that you know, I get these C-suite people like the CEO that say, hey, thou shalt give Neil the data. And then I get on to B here, which is connecting to the database. So if, I've, if I need to connect to an Oracle database, I probably can kill a morning doing that, um, just fiddling around. And that's usually if it, with a DBAs helping me out as well. Um, so they're notoriously difficult to connect to through OLEDB or ODBC drivers. 
Uh, there's something called OData, by the way, that's, that kind of solves that problem if you want to look into it. But still, databases are kind of difficult to connect to. So let's say you get past that, though, and you get into the database now. Well, unfortunately, um, a lot of data models are now what I would call in a very inconvenient form. Um, for those who know a little bit about the history of, of data warehouse modeling, um, you know, you, you have these, these three layers. Um, the middle two are, are the integration layer, and um, then you have the presentation layer. So most people might know the integration layer as like an Inman or third normal form data model, and there, from there you derive what's known as a, a, a presentation layer model, which is, is typically like a star or snowflake schema model, or, or a dimensional model where you have dimensions and facts. Um, but the integration layer is really where it's at. That's where all the data is that you're interested in. And they've become very complex with these modern integration layer architectures. Uh, you may have heard of data vault modeling, or sometimes they call it ensemble modeling, where you have hubs, links, and satellites. And then you have another type of modeling called anchor modeling, where you have like six tables. And like the tables are like, I think, thing, thing attributes, thing effectiveness, and there's a couple others in there. And, and those data models are incredibly complex. In fact, the ETL that loads those data models actually has to be code generated. So you can't even use regular ETL tools to, to populate those models. So they're incredibly difficult or complex to, to query. Um, so that's the second problem. And the third, the fourth, sorry, that's the third problem. And the fourth is, and I think this is actually the biggest problem of all in many ways, because the other one, other problems here are actually, uh, they're all tractable problems, really. If you want to put your mind to it, you can, you can easily solve them. The fourth problem seems to be um, more intractable. And that's the fact that it's very difficult to get data into a database, especially uh, an Excel spreadsheet or an Access database. Um, I'm going to talk a lot more about that in a minute, but this is the, the massive elephant in the room, which is the fact that ex uh, a lot of high value data is essentially just being managed in Excel. And then um, I don't need to get into it, but anybody who's worked with databases know they're very, they're very expensive to replicate. And um, um, they're very, so even just to make a copy of that database is like good luck in, in doing that in less than a week. Um, and, and you'll never be able to migrate from, from one vendor to another. I mean, I, I've never even heard of anybody might going from like SQL Server to Oracle or vice versa. Um, I mean, you hear legends, but it's, it's rare to see that. Um, okay, so those are the, the, these are the, 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 the risks, as I mentioned earlier. But assuming those risks don't exist, you're going to run into um, these challenges if you're trying to do any kind of... Um, business analytics where, where you need to do modeling, uh, where you need to do target data modeling for a dashboard so you can interact with it. The challenge is, is that there's not a lot of um, what I would call high velocity data modelers who can ramp up on uh, new semantic universes. So as a consultant, this is a challenge because um, I'm often being thrown into, rather people who have the experience to model quickly are being thrown into um, completely new industries or sectors. So you could be thrown into marketing or you could be thrown into uh, a telecom or a bank. And anybody who's worked with data knows that you cannot be, um, you cannot be indifferent to the data. You cannot go around saying things like garbage in, garbage out. You have to embrace the data. You have to embrace the semantics because you're going to need to ask clarifying questions because there's going to be a lot of, um, uh, ambiguities that need to be resolved and and the person who's closest to the day is going to be the one who's going to be able to ask those things so it takes a um, it takes a certain type of person who can um, ramp up very quickly on those semantics to the point where they they can start asking those those intelligent questions so that's that's a that's a huge challenge and that's why a lot of business uh, analytics is still being done by non-analyst types because they do understand those those semantic universes um, the other challenge that, that is very common out there is the data variety challenge is a far bigger problem than the data volume challenge. So you may have heard about the big data three Vs, uh, variety, volume, and velocity, and people will tell you, you know, you can do two out of three at once. So you can have a lot of volume of data and you can process it that at high velocity, but if there's a variety in there, no can do. Or you can have um, um, some variety with huge volume, but you can't process it with any velocity and so on. Uh, that's all fine, well and good, but um, the, for the most part, 
it's not actually volume as data that you encounter. In fact, most organizations really only have one or two main sources of voluminous data that they care about. So a bank, you know, will have bank transactions. Telecom will have um, call detail records, uh, which actually they don't really care about too much. It's mainly the subscriber management billing system, work orders, and, and those types of um, uh, subscriber records, customer records that is of big data variety, and even that is not of a huge volume, um, even in a big telecom like Rogers or Bell or Telus. Um, so again, it's the variety, it's the mountain of sand or the mountain of jelly beans that's killing everyone. And um, all these big data tools out there you read about, like Hadoop and Spark and so on, they don't actually really help you there. Um, okay, so assuming that you find your, you, you've got some, some uh, mastery around data modeling and, and some mastery around um, dealing with complex data, um, which is to say where I'm at, um, you're going to run into this bottleneck. Now, a bottleneck is not something you can do about it. It's really, I'm really just showing you how time breaks down. So I was doing um, what's known as Kanban tracking and just really just keeping track of different tasks as I'm working through these agile proof of concepts. And, um, and really what I've, I've discovered uh, after the fact is I spend about two-thirds of my time doing um, uh, ETL development essentially. So when I say data prep here, I don't mean manual data prep where I'm copying and pasting something in Excel. I really mean um, I am um, uh, writing a load script um, in, a, in a, a language like SQL or, or data prep tool. Uh, I use a tool called Click um, or ClickView or ClickSense you may have heard of. Uh, but it could be a tool like Alteryx or Nime and there's, there's many of these data prep tools out there. Um, but that's where most of the time is spent. And uh, you'll notice that only 10% of the time is spent on analysis. That's because um, data prep and analysis kind of go hand in hand. So what you'll normally do when you're developing dashboards, or at least if you're doing it in a very agile way, is you will develop a data model, um, and then you will start to build out charts with that data model to kind of see what, what happens. So if, for example, you're looking to um, you know, reduce, uh, you want to have a dashboard where you're trying to reduce, uh, check um, a dashboard for, Bell, let's say, a Bell Canada or a Rogers, some kind of a call center in a telecom where you're trying to see what the relationship is between average handle time is, it's the time that the customer service rep spends on the phone with you, and the work order revenue. So you may have ordered a new service like HBO or voicemail or whatever. And when you're building out a dashboard to analyze those things, you're building out data elements, and you might do, do develop a, a data element that's, that's the duration of the call, for example, based on the, the call start and end time. And then you realize it's actually not the right field that you want. In fact, you wanted that to be bucketed by minutes or bucketed by 10 seconds or whatever. So you're going between that analysis that you've just done and you'll go back into data prep and you'll rederive that field. And that's kind of how a lot of um, uh, analysis is, is, is actually done in, in, in effect uh, when you're doing data prep at the same time. So the remaining 25% of the time is really just spent on what we're calling presentation. And what that really means is um, picking out the right data visualizations, uh, which is a skill unto itself, and that's something I can talk about in a different presentation. And also dashboard user experience. So by that, we really mean um, uh, all dashboards should at the very least have um, uh, show you an overview, uh, you know, like the total amount of time spent on the phone or the total average handle time, and then be able to give you the ability to zoom and filter on that. So you should maybe see like a, like a bar chart or some table where I can maybe slice and dice by day or call center rep ID or, or you know, whatever else. And then I should be able to show the details on demand. So I should be able to drill down and then see the actual call detail records for that. Um, sorry, I just got a little ahead of myself there. So that's really what we mean by the um, effort to, uh, sorry, what we mean by presentation is the visualization and the dashboard user experience. Um, one last thing about the, the data prep. Um, it's something that is invisible to business users. They don't know what you're doing. Um, they might wonder why things are taking so long. So the way that I explain it to people um, is there's a famous saying by Abraham Lincoln who once said, if you give me six hours to chop down a tree, I'm going to spend four hours sharpening my axe. And that's essentially when you've got that axe nice and sharp and you can whack through those trees really quickly. And that's something that I think resonates with people. So this is the second most important slide in this presentation. And if you take anything away from this presentation, let it be this. Um, there is, this is the elephant in the room. This is the conversation that's not happening that I'm trying to get going. 
Um, and it really comes down to the fact that um, most reporting doesn't happen how I think IT or even uh, a lot of consultants under realize it's happening. This is how it's happening. So I want to walk you through this diagram here. So you'll see on the left, I've got a number of, and these represent business intelligence systems. So, you know, you've got Cognos and MicroStrategy and OBIE and SSAS and, and, and business objects and so on. And the way that these things are used in practice are as um, data extraction engines. So people will go in and they'll, they'll, they'll look for the report. Either the report's already been created and they might just filter on something or they... Sometimes all they have is, you know, this week's monthly report. They'll either get a report, or even if it's, if it's a, a self-serve BI solution, they might, you know, they'll drag and drop some dimensions and measures, whatever the case may be. But that's really just the beginning of the journey. So once they get the, the report or the, the, they've, they've created the report they want, they'll extract it out to Excel. Um, now, the first thing to recognize is that report, once it enters into the um, land of Excel, that becomes data. And that data is being archived by these business analysts, whether you and IT are aware of this or not. Um, and it's really, and those analysts do this not just because it's easy for them to get to, that goes back to that portability thing I was saying earlier on, um, but it, because they don't trust the upstream systems because most people um, aren't very good, or most data architects aren't very good at dealing with what's known as late arriving data. So it's a common issue that you see everywhere where people will say, oh, you know, this report I just ran for April um, is different from when I ran it on May 1st. What the heck is going on? When should I run this report? And the answer is um, you could potentially run that report for the next six months and it'll change because um, data has a habit of trickling in unless you have, you know, uh, rules around expiry and cutoffs and so on and so forth. But BI systems tend not to be that sophisticated. So there, there is a volatility in history. Um, you can work around. There are solutions to it. Actually, SQL 2011 uh, ISO spec actually has bitemporal support built right into it. But it's not something that is, um, I think, uh, well understood enough that people actually deal with it. So people don't know how to articulate what I've just told you and, and, and demand um, as of reporting capabilities and that kind of thing. So that's why they archive these reports. So they've archived the reports, and now what they do, they get to work. And getting to work is, is in some cases, a full-time job for some of these people. So they will actually uh, potentially integrate that data with other data using a combination of cut, copy, and paste and the, and the, the famous VLOOKUP function. And they'll also use pivot tables as well, and they'll, copy, they'll, they'll, they'll create pivot tables, and then they'll copy from those pivot tables potentially into other sheets and continue working. They might also email that report to someone else who will then take that as an input and start mashing that up with their other extracts. Um, they might also um, mash in what I call the dark data. So that could be a mapping table, you know, mapping uh, cities to regions, for example. Like different units will have different ways of organizing regional information or categories, and they'll they'll just map it in the, at this level right here. And, um, and that's the dark data, as I mentioned earlier. Or they might even have adjustments. And they'll say they'll have, and some of these adjustments, by the way, are just lists that somebody has recorded of some IDs that they know mentally to filter out every time they do this report. So then finally, it ends up in a pivot table or a pivot chart. And it ultimately is delivered in the form of an Excel or PowerPoint document um, and then emailed to the boss. So one of the things I want to point out about this um, this pattern, and this pattern is everywhere. And it's, it is in our company, PwC, this pattern is in every single one of the clients. This pattern is in uh, companies like Click that are supposed to have solved this problem. So it's, it, this, is the, this is the conversation I, I really am hoping to get going here. Um, and I don't have a problem with Excel, and I wanna be really clear on why Excel is so popular um, and why it's never going to go away, and why this problem is just getting worse by the day. It has to do with the fact that um, fundamentally it comes down to control and trust. So people feel that they have more control over Excel and that they can trust it because they understand those transformations. Now, on the control side, um, that's a legitimate reason because Excel is what I call an editable grid. It gives you a level of, of flexibility that you can go in and make any change to any cell you want. And there's, like a, a, there's a sort of a, a continuum or spectrum of flexibility 
that is worth looking at. So on one of the extreme, you have very controlled uh, ETL or, or scripted data prep, and that's you know an ideal way of transforming data because everything is controllable and audible and all that stuff. And then you have this Excel world here that I'm showing you here. And believe it or not, it, you know there are actually controls in a lot of places to make sure those reports are produced uh, correctly, but the business is in charge of that. And then you know you can get even more flexible than that if you think about it because a lot of us do our thinking on a pad of paper with a pencil and we'll just sketch things out and draw doodles and diagrams and so on and then you know you might even want to lean back and close your eyes and look up and just sort of you know contemplate and imagine things so we that's just how we work and the problem is is that we're just it's not that we're that that um working with excel is wrong it's that we're doing this repetitive stuff too much so I use Excel all the time, but I use it in an ad hoc way. And I think that's exactly what you should be doing with it. But what's killing us is there's just this repetitive manual data prep out there. And it's, it's the, you know, this example here, it, it seems extreme, but actually I can show you much more extreme examples in the wild. I can tell you about one client that spends three weeks across five people to produce a monthly report. So um, this is obviously costing the economy a big chunk of money and um, yeah it's just not talked about so this is the problem I'm tr trying to kind of take head on if you will so why what causes this problem um, so this is an analogy this is a metaphor uh, but I think it's a good way of thinking about the problem uh, the, 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 the root of this problem comes down to the fact that um, systems developed um, by people like myself or IT technologists, if you will, tend to, to have a very closed loop feel to them. And I think it's fascinating that, um, and, and by the way, as you saw earlier on from my background, I, I, you know, I'm a comp sci major at Waterloo. I'm, I'm very much a techie. That is my comfort zone. Um, and if you talk to a lot of techies like myself, you'll notice that, you know, we're, we really like trains for some reason. Uh, you know, watch the Big Bang Theory. Sheldon Cooper likes trains, and Elon Musk has, has invented this Hyperloop. And you know, you re read about these competitions between you know Germany and Japan and China, and the, the the fastest maglev train in the world. And you know, I think there was a record set a few weeks ago in Japan, 780 miles an hour, or something crazy like that. So, what is it that sort of captures the imagination about this? And I think it's a kind of a utopia where all the inputs and outputs are controlled, and I think there's a lot of really good things about trains, and this is this is a really important point to make that trains aren't bad. They're really great. They're very scalable. They're very um, uh, efficient. They're environmentally friendly. They're enjoyable to ride. They go very fast. But the problem with the train is, if you want the train to go somewhere it doesn't go already, you need to lay down track, and laying down track is extremely expensive. So, um, so it doesn't happen very often. And if you want that train to stop between stations, it will not. Um, God help you if there's a train in front of you. I'm not sure, by the way, if you guys ever take the Via from Toronto to Montreal. It's a miracle if it's on time because they lease the lines from CN who gets right of way. It's, sort of, it's actually an insane, an insane aspect of, of Canada and North America that freight has right of way over passengers. If you, if you ever lived in Europe or been to Europe, passengers have right of way over freight. Um, and of course, you cannot bring your own train onto those tracks. God help you. Now, the alternative right now to the train is this anarchy that I've just shown you. And I, I, I'm not sure if I would call this anarchy or not, but it's sort of, it's a little bit anarchic. Um, and this is kind of the choice you're given, the train or the anarchy, the train or the anarchy. And I feel this is a false choice because if you look in, outside in the real world, especially in North America, especially the United States, um, we have this other system called the Open Roads and Highway System, where we have a Highway Traffic Act um, with literally hundreds of rules. Um, there is an OPP um, police that will enforce those rules on the highway. If you want to drive a car, you need to pass a driver's test, uh, and a pretty extensive one, both a written and an actual um, uh, driven uh, driver's test. Um, by the way, a passenger can go in your car with you, and they don't need to do anything. Um, you know, there's, there's signs and rules, rules around the road. You can bring your own car, but it has to be certified. It has to be emissions tested. And if you want to take your car off road, you're, you're allowed to do that. Um, and this is kind of, this is a philosophy. This is getting into, you know, I'd say a, a, a paradigm shift or philo a philosophical shift, which is, which really comes down to 
is there a way that we can let that Excel world um, play in a more governed environment? Is, it, is this possible? And I think it is. Um, and I sort of take as inspiration, as I said, this, this sort of model. And I think back, well, what, you know, what would the open roads and highway system do you know, with this problem? And, and there's a lot of inspiration there to be had. So I want to get back to this, this concept of portability. Um, and by the way, when I think about portability, I'm thinking about the cars that move around the road. I want the data to move around the road like the cars. Um, and how do you do that? Um, because I've already told you that putting data in databases really makes it unportable, very difficult to get out. Um, the way that you do that is you deal in documents. Documents are your Lego blocks, and a um, data can be put into a document. Um, data, when it gets to a certain scale, you need to chop that up into multiple documents. That's what we call partitioning. Uh, but it's not just the data. I would say that the uh, data cleansing adjustment can be put into flat files. Uh, if you've ever seen these, these uh, data quality improvement tools like Quality Stage, and I think SAS makes one, Dataflux or something like that, uh, they all live in these databases behind these service layers, and you need some special person who can access it and change these things. That's um, unfortunate to me because that means it's not portable anymore. And, 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 the, and the business person who is in best to make those changes and, and maintain that is, is essentially cut off from that. I think that the um, moving down the list here, dashboards themselves can, are doc, can be made into documents. In fact, if you look at the latest leader quadrant for business analytics and Gartner, it, they've really just wiped the board clean and it's just uh, Tableau, Click, and Power BI that sits there now. And they all have that document-based model, funnily enough. Uh, even the data prep itself, the ETL, that can be in a single document. Click actually has the nice benefit of having both the data prep and the dashboard in the same document. And also uh, metadata, so data definitions, um, uh, rules for how you integrate the data, rules for how you roll up the data, uh, what some people are now calling context or other people might call pedigree, that can be put into a document as well. And if everything is in a document, then you don't need to fight for database or service layer access anymore. And you can easily just move it into uh, a data lake, uh, not a Hadoop data lake, by the way. That's a bad idea, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, but into um, a data lake that's business accessible. That might be on, you know, if you're in Windows NTFS, or if you're on Mac, it would be something like NFS or Linux. Um, and that's the name of the game, really. Um, I, I show you a picture here, by the way, of a book called The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. And this book is a popular book in the self-help section. And really, it's just a very simple system. It's what I would call a slotting system, where you just essentially figure out what it is I, I, I need to categorize um, or bucket. And, once, and then you basically go through your house, and you tidy up, and you put it in these different boxes and areas and closets and so forth. And going forward, you have a blueprint for where things should get slotted into. And so that way, if you get this sort of oddball uh, gift that you have no idea what to do with, you know where to put it right away and it doesn't clutter up your countertop. And this is actually um, in, in uh, self-help because it's actually being attributed to a lot of mental health help. A lot of mental health issues, a lot of depression comes from messy clutter house. And I, and I honestly believe um, from, from working with people that a lot of the anxiety people feel at work comes down to this inability to obtain or access the data. Uh, or even know where to put it. And, and if we all kind of kind of agree on a system that's really open, I think it's going to lead to a lot of um, benefits. So um, how are we doing for time here, guys? Are we okay? All right. All right. So now I want to get into, so I've talked about all these problems here. And what I want to get into is how we're actually doing this Agile Linux. What is this, what is this magic that we're doing? So um, there's really three types of Agile Linux uh, starting points for uh, an Agile or digital, an uh, digital analytics project. Uh, the first is the most pure form of um, digital analytics projects, and that's the what I call the 20 questions. And um, that's when um, that's a bit more greenfieldish when people have a lot of data they've accumulated, but they haven't done anything really with BI yet, and they're really just mucking around in Excel. Uh, there's still a lot of those people out there, by the way. 
Um, and the way we just be, we, we deal with those pro projects is we don't go in and say, hey, I'm going to start you know documenting requirements and you know tell me what your requirements are and you know that's that's where you get all these failed BI projects when they go off and they do that they take that approach. Um, the better way of doing it is asking them what questions they want to answer. And it could just be five questions is enough, or even three questions for that matter. But I, I think five is, is kind of the minimum that you should start with. And, um, and then you basically just go from there. And, and, and often people even struggle to come up with these questions. So I'll try to um, uh, nudge them a little bit and say things like, well, what is it you want to count or measure? Uh, oh, you know, I guess I want to know how many people came to my airport. Oh, OK, well, maybe you want to know what type of people came to your airport um, uh, and how many of each type. Oh yeah, that could be quick. So you know, it's kind of like you get once you get the kind of creative juices flowing, it's actually easy to get these questions going. So that's the kind of I think the most purest form of agile analytics, and uh, and to this day is 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 my favorite form because uh, you know I, I always I always get a I always get a natural high and when when we uncover some some new insights for the first time. We actually one of the earlier projects I did, there was a client. Um, in uh, in transit that had issues with his devices and they were producing exceptions and they didn't know how many they didn't exactly know where these exceptions were coming from and how many there were of each type and they were there's just incredible amount of confusion they had maxed their way out in excel so they were were, were really um uh, handcuffed and their and their it provider they had outsourced to one of these big it outsourcing companies and it was very very difficult for them to get any sort of ad hoc answer from them without spending a million dollars so um, we actually not only uncovered the, showed them a complete breakdown of the exceptions, but we actually found out the root cause of 85% of the exceptions. And it turned out there was because of, uh, a bunch of devices were misconfigured and they were just spewing exceptions. Um, it, you know, and it's funny cause you know, there's always people that come out of the woodwork when you bring these things up. Oh, I knew about that. I didn't think it was causing you these problems. And of course, meanwhile, finance has to manually process it and cost them a fortune. So that, you know, that, that's an example of something that can come out of this approach. If, um, you know, you, you, you instrument your BI from the get go using these questions. The second approach, which is, um, not as common, but, um, I worked on a couple of projects like this is where somebody has done what's known as, a, as an EPM project. And EPM stands for Enterprise Performance Management. And that's all kind of based on these Norton and Kaplan books. So if you've ever heard of these books like The Balance Scorecard or Strategy Maps, I think there's about five of them now. Um, I'll just summarize really quickly what they, how they approach the world. What they say is, well, you know, if you've got a really big business and you want to steer it, you should be data driven, which is absolutely correct. And um, they'll say, you know, what you want to do is you want to sit down and figure out what your strategy is. And you create these things called strategy maps. And then from your strategy maps, you can determine what those your, your business objectives are. And from there, you can determine what your business drivers are. And from there, you can determine what your metrics or your KPIs, which stands for key performance indicator or your KRIs, which stands for key risk indicator. Um, now, here's the interesting thing about all that stuff. Uh, it doesn't get validated until the very end. And I've been on a couple of these. And in some cases, I've seen um, them be uh well kind of a complete failure so uh especially in places where there's a lot of privacy restrictions um so there was a healthcare client where you know there was a lot of kpis that were developed by somebody else and we we're i was asked to come in and um you know start to just build them out and validate them and it turned out they really could only build one or two of the kpis because most of the data it was it was for all intents and purposes they were not going to be able to obtain it for at least six months so um because it dealt with you know patient details and so on right so that's always a, that's always a tricky one so the sooner you can validate the kpis the better and by the way and that exercise we uncovered all this other data that um it turned out could be used to drive other business objectives so you know there's a way of um, it's a it's a great way of sort of not only just validating whether you can build what you want, but also discovering data that might be um, useful as a proxy. So now I want to talk about the third type of project, which I think is I haven't done too many of these yet, and I tell everyone about this. The I call it the trillion dollar uh, sales pitch. So remember this this little slide over here. Uh, sorry, my problem's going back. So there's actually um, a trillion dollar solution that goes with a trillion dollar problem and the trillion dollar solution um, 
I'll just give you the sales pitch. So um, I was, it was at a mid-size um, auto parts manufacturer and um, the, it was a Friday and the CEO had just come back from a liquid lunch and uh, had been feeling kind of jovial and aggressive all at the same time, if you, if you know that type. And um, uh, so we got a meeting with him just after lunch on a Friday and he, I'd never met him before and, and um, you know, we made sort of polite introductions and he turns to me and he says, look, Neil, I'll be honest with you. You're here because you're our auditor and your rates are very high and companies like mine don't normally pay like to pay like those rates. So you better tell me, you know, you don't have a lot of time here. So tell me, tell me why I'm talking to you. And I said, okay, I understand. Uh, I just have one, Anthony, I just have one question for you. Um, do you have a, uh, a killer report that you make the majority of your decisions based off of? And he says, yeah, of course, it's the weekly blah, 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 blah report. I said, okay, perfect. I, I'm, I thought you might have something like that. Um, and by the way, pretty much anyone, until you get to the super high executive level, like the CEO of, oh, I don't know, RBC or Bell Canada, most people actually look at reports. You know, when you get up to the, you know, as I said, the C-suite and very, uh, very, very large organizations, they don't really look at data anymore. Uh, or if they do, it's a very, very highly distilled, you know, KPI graph, infographic or something. But most people look at reports. Most people look at these Excel reports. So I said to him uh, after that, I said, okay, Anthony, perfect. Uh, I said, all I want to do is I want to take that report and I just want to make it drillable. I I'm sure you, you wanted to drill in from, I don't know, months to days or teams into people or plants into SKUs. Um, you name it. I, I, you know, if it's drillable, I will make it. If it's possible to make it drillable, I will make it drillable. And, it, and I'm pretty sure it's possible. He says, you can do that? I said, uh, yeah, I've done it before. I've done it many times, actually. It's like, he was like, sold, sold. Uh, that's incredible. I said, hold on. Let me ask you another question. I know, or rather, I suspect that you're probably archiving these reports, aren't you? You probably have them going back months or years. He's like, yeah, of course I do. Okay, great. So I just want to take all those reports you've been accumulating for all that time, and I want to show you what they look like over time. I want to trend all that information for you. Um, and um, for the first time, you'll see what that entire report looks like over time, every, every part of it. Wow, that, that's incredible. Yeah, no, uh, when can you get started? And I said, hold on. Um, you know, if I got the hood open, uh, we're doing this work for you, then I might as well mash in some other data. Like uh, maybe you want to have an org chart mashed in there or an item master. I don't know. B you name it. It's actually pretty easy to do. We've got, we've got good tools and, and we've got people who can do this quickly. He's like, oh man, this, is, this just keeps on getting better. And, and then I said, yes. And um, one last thing, it's all going to be automated. And, and, that, and, and that's the important thing when you're talking um, about these reports, which are consuming all this this time, is to lead with the drill down, trending, integration, and then mention the automation. Because there's another person sitting in that room who is, who is depending on how you explain that, is very threatened by all this, potentially. And it depends on the person. So if it's a younger person who's got their entire career in front of them, they are already sold on automation. Um, because they don't necessarily look at this as a good part of their job. They look at that as tedious. If it's somebody on their way out of their career, they might just think, hey, man, I'm just on cruise control until retirement. Like, why are you doing this? Um, and that's always, a, it's always a very tricky situation. And I, and, um, and I think that, you know, creating that momentum through, because often these guys will say, if you lead with automation, they'll say, you don't want that because I, I've never been able to not give you what you want, Mr. CEO. And, you know, I, um, nobody asked for this. Why, you know, nobody's asking for automation. Like everything looks well, good and you trust it and everything's good. Why do you want that? So they will, you know, they will start to throw up uh, possible roadblocks before you can open your mouth. So uh, by creating that sort of demand for an interactive dashboard, um, it creates the momentum where you can then see those real um, savings. So you saw a slide earlier on, I said, come for the drill down, stay for the automation. Uh, again, this is something that I think is a really valuable insight and I, and I encourage all of you to, to take full advantage of that. So how do we actually do Agile Linux projects? Um, well, we start off with a collaboration meeting. So that's really just 
um, where we get all the stakeholders together in, in, in a room. And, and by that, I mean people on the business side, people on the IT side, um, could be data architect, DBA, business analyst, um, business manager. We'll often have executives, a lot of curiosity around this. And um, we basically then, you know, determine what, um, what questions we're going to answer, or maybe, maybe they walk us through the Excel spreadsheet that they have, uh, the report that they know and love. And that's our sort of kickoff meeting. And once we kick off, um, we start to go through this, this weekly iteration cycle. And the iterations, they all kind of follow the same path. Um, as you can see, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So we, we will try to identify the data. And, and by the way, when we identify data, we're not just identifying the data itself, but we're also looking for other data, typically reports, that we can validate that data against. Um, so when I say we, you know, we move quickly and we prototype, it's very important that the data be accurate. Uh, a lot of you know, people will make the mistake of just assuming that a mock-up is what people want. Um, and that is, if it looks like a dashboard, it looks um, like it's approximate, then it'll be okay. That's not acceptable in my books. You have to have the data as accurate as possible. You have to establish credibility as soon as possible because business users will not engage you. They won't pay attention to anything else if they don't believe that the numbers are correct. So that's why you want to ask for a validation report up front so that you can reconcile against. Um, then you want to obtain the data. Now, right, right off the bat, you want to get this into flat file format. And if it's a big data set, you want to be partitioning that. So by partitioning, I mean breaking it into chunks. And I tend to like to partition using what I would call a natural business key according to a natural query bias. So natural query biases tend to be, I'm interested in looking at last month's data or the month before that. Or maybe if it is, um, you know, let's say an auto dealership, it could be partitioned by, um, by time and it could be partitioned by um, the car model, right? So, um, but what you want to do is get it into chunks. Ideally, 51% um, of those partitions are a million rows or less. Um, and then I basically start to slot it into this portable data lake system, which is really just a folder templating system where I have a naming convention. Um, so once I've got that data, it's surfaced and flat. Now I can work really fast. And by the way, with partitions, you don't need to work with all partitions at once. You only need to work with one partition at once. So when you're working with flat files and partitions already, if you're not doing that and you're working with databases, and I, I have to go around um, whacking people in my office now who try to like, oh, I'll put it into a SQL server and then I'll get to work. I'm like, no, you're wasting time, flat files. Um, then I ba basically move on to the, what I call the model and prep stage where I'm basically, you know, data prep is really just building um, scripts. And you, you know, I prefer using this, this tool called Click, uh, which comes in Click View and Click Sense. It's like a, a, an SQL type of language. Although I know there's other data prep tools out there like NIME and, and Alteryx um, and Power Query. Uh, and really what data prep is, is you're just cleansing, you're shaping, you're integrating the data. And then you are moving on to analysis and you're just, that's where you're actually trying to answer those questions that came up during the initial kickoff meeting. Um, but here's the other key sort of part about this phase is that you're not just answering questions. Now you're gonna be pushing requirements back up again. So you see at the beginning there, I have what I call guiding questions that are coming top down. You're gonna be pushing clarifying questions from the bottom up. So you'll say, well, what's the difference between transaction type and transaction code? And why, when do I use one and not the other? And should I be using this and not? And that's, and that's um, um, you know, that, that's how you, you, know, uh, you make things work. Um, and of course, you know, you, you move on to once you've you know done your analysis and you've got answered the questions. Now, now the now it's actually the fun part where you're you're figuring out what the um, how to visualize and present the data. And I'm also actually building up what's known as a data story, um, which is a feature that these BI tools uh, all seem to have now. So if you've ever used Tableau, they have something called I think Story Points. Uh, Microsoft has integrated Power BI and PowerPoint into one, so you can actually have a presentation in PowerPoint that takes you back to a dashboard. Click uh, Sense has a feature called Data Storytelling, where it's essentially like a mini version of PowerPoint where you can put together slides, like the one you're looking at here, but you can have charts on there which are auto-highlighting um, you know, values like a min or a max, and it allows you to then drill into that report and then answer any follow-up questions. So, 
Um, so that's how you really want to be presenting your insights in the form of a data story, in, in the form of a data story that leads you into a, a dashboard. Um, and then you have the collaboration meeting where a collaboration meeting, essentially when you, when you've, you finish that iteration, you, you basically spend a few minutes saying, you know, here's what you asked us to do. Here's what we actually managed to get done. And here's the demo. And then you say, Hey, here's how I've answered your questions. You want to have any follow-up questions? Do you have any other questions and questions? As we all know, if you know anything about the Basili method, questions prompt more questions. It's a constant feedback loop. So in some cases you might even be done on the first or second iteration. And in other cases, um, typically three to six iterations is, is uh, sufficient for most projects. Um, sometimes you'll go as high as 10 iterations. Where I find actually where the business likes to uh, needle around the most is on the uh, user experience and the visualizations. So that's where a lot of conversations can be drawn out, especially if they're into you know, fine tuning how this dashboard is going to look. So that's how that process works. This is how it works over time. This is a bit of an eye chart. I'm not really going to spend too much time. I've already kind of described all these things to you. Um, I want to kind of describe the middle row a little bit more. Uh, this is another thing that comes up in practice, which is when you first start to model. So mod data modeling is, uh, and I mentioned already, it's the biggest challenge. Finding high velocity modelers, very hard to do. And you don't always have them on hand throughout the duration of the project. So I tend to be, uh, you tend to want to actually have two roles. You want to have a more senior modeler who can provide some direction and guidance at the beginning of the project, someone like myself, but there's colleagues of mine who are now at my level. And I'd say the junior builder modeler. And um, the junior modeler or even a senior modeler is essentially just going to model reactively. They're gonna model to answer the questions. But what ends up happening for anybody who knows anything about architecture is that if you model reactively, you'll find you'll get a stovepipe model. So it becomes unwieldy and that slows down your velocity. So now every little change becomes very difficult and expensive. So around the third iteration, it actually sometimes makes sense. And it depends on the type of data in the project and all that. Sometimes this is not necessary. But if it is, around the third iteration, you want to just say, all right, guys, I know we like to go every week with um, feedback, but we're going to take a couple weeks off here and we're going to do a big refactor because it's becoming really, con this model is becoming really confusing and difficult to change. So we think that if we refactor it, you're going to get that velocity again. So time out, take a vacation. We're going to, we're going to work on that and come back. And that's where, um, you know, that, that's one of the things that you kind of learn over time. One of the, the, the secrets, so to speak to this, making this work. Uh, I'll let you read the other things as well. There's some useful information if you understand the portable data lake system, which I'll talk about in a second. So one of the other interesting kind of findings that comes out of all of this is um, around disintermediation. And this is something I'm a huge fan of. So what that really means, that's just a fancy word for getting the propeller head to talk to the executive. And the, what, what I've noticed is that there is a natural repellent between these two people. Um, and the reason is that on, uh, and I've seen this uh, you know, happen. I'll, I'll give you actually a story. It was uh, one of our clients in a business, uh, what, what do they call this business again? I, don't, I can't give away the name, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a business outsourcing business. Um, they do a lot of um, payroll stuff. So the client um, didn't really, didn't know how to articulate anything. She was like, I want, I just want to know what's going on with, you know, these companies we're supporting and really very poor direction. And I said, okay, well, I'll see what I, I'll cook up a straw man dashboard. You haven't really given me any questions. You haven't given me anything. It was the most vague requirements I've ever been given in my life. And she couldn't even come up with like a single question or measurement or like that. She just, you know, here's the data and I just kind of want to see some interesting things here. So I did this thing, which I call outlier analysis, where I'll just, um, if you ever heard of Beyond Core, there's a company called Beyond Core that made a whole business out of something you could code up in an afternoon, which is kind of funny. Um, and all, all, all you need to do is you just look at all your dimensions and your measures and you take every, co you take every combination of two dimensions and, um, for the statisticians in the room here, this is worth paying attention to. And you take every, so let's say a dimension is, let's say gender and age. And then the third dimension is, you know, the city you live in. So you take every combination of gender and age, and then you take, let's say a measure like revenue. Um, and you see if there is based on the count of, um, uh, you, you compare the count of a combination of dimensions 
to the other measure. So let's say you notice, for example, that 15% um, of all revenue comes from 2% of the population that happens to be women over b between the ages of uh, 24 and 35. That's an outlier. That's something that's, whoa, that segment's kind of interesting. And that's what you kind of want to help. And I was kind of like, you know, every now and then, I, 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 I'm, I'm constantly humbled in my job. Um, I thought, hey, you know, I'm pretty proud of this. And I got this, this colleague of mine who's, I guess, the, the scientist in this picture here. I'm not really playing the scientist role here. I had a, a colleague of mine do this. And um, so he built this thing, and it was pretty, pretty amazing. We found some pretty cool things. When we showed it to the client. She looked at it, and she's like, what is this? And I said, well, it's all these outliers. And she's like, no, 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 no. I just want to see lay of the land. I just want to see the basics. I just want to see how much revenue by location. I'm, and I just assumed that they, they, she knew all these things. But she didn't. She didn't. She didn't. Um, so, so anyway, while we're doing all of this, um, while I'm sitting this, uh, the, the guy that you know, is working with me, who's developing all this, he was very stressed out by this. He didn't, he didn't like even the way I was starting this. He was like, Neil, this is, you're insane. You, need, you should get requirements. You should get a top-down list of waterfall requirements. Bad advice. Um, but he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't like that situation because he felt very stressed out. Um, then she started becoming more specific because even the nice thing about um, straw men is even if it fails, it's still success because it forces, it gives people um, some a sounding board that they can think against. So, so what happened was she's like, no, I want to lay a land. I want to see this by location. I want to see this by um, time and, and, and so on and so forth. And then th he comes back the following week with all of those things and then some, and she was over the moon delighted. Now, five minutes going into that meeting, this guy was just sweating bullets. He's like, I don't know what she wants. I, I, she's going to be unhappy again. She's going to get angry with me again. And of course, she was never angry to begin with. She was just, you know, frustrated like everyone else gets if they don't get what they expect. Um, and from there on in, this guy was just a hero. And I basically, you know, so I facilitated those first two meetings. I facilitated the third and fourth. And eventually I was like, you guys just go at it because once you get past that straw man, now she can be specific. Now she's saying, all right, I need this order like this. I need you to, no, this should not be a line chart. I need this to be more like a stacked bar chart. I need you now to blend in this other data source. So once you've got that straw man, once you have that toehold, then the, um, the facilitator actually is just um, not really adding any value and is like just broken telephone because these are very specific things. And that's, that's um, how you want to be managing these things um, is, is to get these, these, these tech savvy people talking to the business. So another, um, another tip I'll give you is use, um, I'm a big fan of as the associative model. Um, and there's really only two mainstream software products that seem to have this and that's Click and uh, Microsoft Power BI. And Microsoft being the fast follower uh, for those of you who don't know, actually, Microsoft's strategy is actually very simple. They do actually go off and invent things from time to time, and, and that kind of is more of a morale-boosting thing than anything else. Their real strategy is fast follower. So they don't pretend to be a company like Google or Apple, and um, they, they don't have the level of hubris those companies do to say, we can invent the future and you're going to love it. They know that, that that is an inherently unpredictable thing to do. So they are really just looking for best of breed products and trying to copy them as quickly as possible. So Power BI, I can tell you firsthand, was essentially just a copy of Click. And they copied Click's data model, and it's still about four or five years behind. So what is this associative model I talk about? And actually, I was just at the Click conference a couple weeks ago in Orlando, and I actually spoke to Donald Farmer, who is their, their chief innovation officer. And I also talked to some of their other uh, marketing people. And I think that they don't, they don't really know how to explain this thing. So I'm going to explain it to you. Um, the associative model basically allows you to avoid what is known as a fan trap. Now, you might not know it by name, but you have probably encountered a fan trap before if you, do, if you deal with business intelligence or analytics. And I'll give you an example, and I'll, and I'll tell you how the traditional BI architects solve the fan trap problem. So if you remember earlier on, I was talking about, I want to create a dashboard where I can analyze the, the call detail records, or sometimes they call them IVR records, that are coming into the call center of a Bell Canada or a Rogers or a TELUS. And if you've ever worked with a call center before, they always like to re minimize what they call the average handle time or the operator workstation time. They want, they want to get you off the phone as soon as possible. Uh, by the way, Apple actually has the opposite policy. They actually 
don't want to get you off the phone, which is kind of cool if you think about it. But for everybody else, they all want to get you off the phone. So they want to minimize that number. But they also want to sell you stuff. And they're really hoping that you'll get a work order and, incre and increase your monthly subscriber revenue. So if you can imagine calling up the, 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 the call center at Bell and saying, OK, I want to order HBO. And well, I've got my phone with you as well. And, and come to think of it, I, I wouldn't mind this, this voicemail feature. Can I get that as well? So they put in a work order for the, um, for the HBO. And, and then they put in the work so I can watch my John Oliver show. And then they put in the work order for the uh, voicemail. And that's another, let's say, $10 a month. So I have a work order for $5 a month and then another work order for $10 a month. And if you add that up, it's, it's $15 a month. Now, we were on the phone for 10 minutes. Um, so we have two work orders and we have two calls. So we have, when in, in, in the parlance of, of data warehousing, we have two fact tables. Now, if you join that, if, you, if you've ever worked with SQL and you join those two tables together and you join it based on the call detail record ID, what will happen is that single call record turns into two call records. So 10 minutes turns into 20 minutes. And this is a constant problem when you're dealing with um, BI that is anything more than simplistic. This is also another reason why so much BI is simplistic because of the fan traps. Um, so what do you do? Uh, in the BI world, um, some people just get flummoxed and they're like, well, I'll build two different dashboards or two different cubes. If you talk to real, the seasoned pros, they will tell you clever things like this. They'll, um, um, they'll, say, they'll say, oh, here, Neil, well, here's what you do. You take that call detail record ID and you convert it into a number. And then you take that average handle time, that 10 minutes, and you multiply it by a big number, like a trillion. And then you take that, that, that call detail record ID, which you've, which you've just converted into a number, and you add it as the fractional part of the number. So it becomes like 10 trillion point, you know, five, four, six, seven, eight, whatever. And then, and here's the trick, you do a sum distinct on that number, and then you divide that back out by a trillion, and there's your answer. And I'm like, that's brilliant, man. Like, well, okay, well, what about averages? What about blah, blah, blah? And of course, it's just this constant um, battle uphill to deal with these fan traps. And, I, and I've, I've worked on BI projects like this before where the fan trap issues have taken up a huge chunk of my time. Now, the thing with Click and um, Tableau, by the way, they, sorry, not Tableau. Tableau, unfortunately, is still OLAP cube-based. Power BI, um, they basically use this, Power BI calls it a tabular model. It is just the associated model. And the way they get around this is they have a concept of linking. They don't join. So when you're linking, they have these these special types of indexes they've built that allows them to very quickly determine based on my selection in the work order table what records are possible in my call detail record table so i'm not going to combine these two things thank you i'm just going to um you know apply this extremely complex filter which might involve millions of rows on this other table here um, so that, you know, I'm, so, I'm sorry to take so long to de describe that, but I think it's an important point that is not appreciated enough in the data architecture community and unfortunately has been conflated with other things in clicks marketing. So people like myself who are a bit more savvy will pick apart the marketing talk and say, oh, I can do this, this and that because they're, they're trying to like sell all these other benefits with the associated model and you actually don't need the associated model for these other benefits. So then wise guys like me will throw the baby out with the bathwater and not realize that no, this associated model actually does have something that's unique to it. So um, the other thing I'll point out with these tools is that as mentioned earlier, they're portable. They're all just documents, the data, the load script and the presentation is in one document. Um, they both have sub-second response time. So if I'm clicking through selections, sub-second is also a very key number. Um, I, I throw out sub-second response time because this is a magical threshold if you're doing analysis. If you've ever read uh, Super Freakonomics, they talk about um, if you get an answer back in less than a second, your mind remains in a state of flow. If things take... Um, more than a second, you, your train of thought can get interrupted a little bit, but you more or less have concentration and focus. Once it goes above 10 seconds, and that's a lot of BI systems I deal with out there, sometimes I'll see 90 seconds or even longer for a, sing, for a single filter selection. Um, then that's when you go off to, to, to get a coffee and, and you stop thinking about things. And a problem that could have been dealt with in 10 minutes in a sub-second system could take a day or two. Um, 
I also believe that you use tools like Click and Power BI. The data prep is built into it, so you're not wasting time context switching. Um, and the way you scale out on these things is um, through document partitioning. Um, and I'll talk about some of these other things in a second. So the, um, the main thing, actually, that uh, uh, the other big thing that I, I, I want to point out is this is something that we've invented. And I'm trying to get this out there on GitHub, to be honest with you, under a Creative Commons license. And this is the portable data lake system, which is the underpinning of this, the sustainable agile Linux system that um, I've developed. And um, I'm going to kind of get right into, well, I know we're kind of running a little bit short of time. I want to be able to take questions. So um, really what I'm just going to say is that the portable data lake system is essentially just a, uh, a management system that uh, uses folders and file naming conventions uh, to organize data. So it's something that people have already kind of figured out on their own intuitively. And, and everywhere I go, I'll meet somebody who says, oh, I've been kind of doing something like this already, but I never really thought it through entirely. And um, I guess that's the advantage of having a strong data management, data warehousing, academic background, if you will, is you know what, you know what these other guys, you know what the Data Vault guys and Inman and Kimball and all these guys were trying to do. If you've read all these books like I have, I understand what they're trying to accomplish, and I've been able to accomplish it using flat files. So my folders, for example, I'll just, I'll just read you the highlights here, um, contain the classification. So if you've ever done information management classification before, you know about the CIA triad, the confidentiality, integrity, availability, and retention. So I have that in there. The, the, the integrity, the confidentiality, the retention is baked into the folder name. Um, if you look at the file name, the naming convention I have down there, you'll notice I'll have the table name, um, which is invoices. I'll have the table partition key type, which is a monthly partition. I'll have the partition um, value range, uh, which in this case is April of, of this year, 2016. And this is a really important one. I have the as of timestamp when that partition was created. And then finally, I have a schema version because over time, schemas can change. You have this, this notion of schema evolution, which, by the way, that's why all those data vault models were created to begin with, to deal with those problems. I encode all the data in either Excel or CSV. Um, uh, you know, I put ORC there. I, I, I really, the, the, the honest truth, it's more like a QVD, a click view um, data file, or it could be a Tableau TDE file. Um, uh, you want to have at least two of these, uh, two versions of your data in multiple formats. And the reason is both for accessibility reasons, but also for integrity reasons. Because if something goes wrong in one of them, then you have a, a backup. Ideally, you even have it in three. Uh, so, so that way, you can kind of take a quorum type of approach if anything goes wrong. Um, I've developed templates for metadata. So I've developed, um, and I also developed a system for dealing with metadata through a combination of Windows shortcuts. So I'll actually create little shortcuts between data sets and data apps and data context. So you can actually surf the file system kind of like the web. Um, and I've also created templates for mashup rules. This is how you integrate the data. I've created templates for roll-up rules. This is how you aggregate the data. You average it or sum it or what, or, you know, multi-level weighted average you might have. And I also have templates for essentially just a data dictionary, data element details. Um, traceability is a big deal. You know, we talked about trust earlier on. Um, if you have this naming convention, you can load that file. When you load that file into your dashboard, you can capture, as long as you capture the original file name and the original record number, then for any given data element in your dashboard, you can look and see where the heck did this come from. And I know instantly, ah, it came from the invoices extract of this month, and it was produced at this exact moment in time, and here's the record number in there. And I can go back and find that file if I need to. These are all non-volatile files, by the way. If that monthly partition ever changes, it just gets pushed into an archive folder, and the as of timestamp changes. So you know, whenever you have inconsistency, it's often because people extract the data at different times. So I go, hey, when was what was the file? Was it identical to the one I had, or was it the same month and maybe a different as of timestamp? So here's another thing I'll point out. Um, so that's just a you know you can if you if you're looking at this presentation at home you can go back in the video and 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 look at some of these other things. There's a there's a lot of other problems and that I that I haven't even been able to cover here because I just you know don't only have so much space. Maturity model. Um, the other thing I want to point out is everyone has this concept of data lake and data swamp back to front. Um, people will say things like, oh, you don't govern your data lake property, it's going to turn into a data swamp. Well, why not try this out for size? 
start in the data swamp, and if you think you hit that maturity level, then move into the data lake. And as I mentioned earlier with files and folders, that movement is like dragging and dropping from the Windows Explorer folder A into folder B. So it's very, very, very simple to do that. Um, the trick with all this maturity and having the controls one of the keys is around this Excel data that business controlled. So if you're going to put effort in controls, which you should, uh, but you don't have to, you can have what we call a T3 data source, and you can push that tier three data source um, into the lake in a controlled way um, using, you can, and, and, and there's any number of ways. You could do it via SharePoint front end, or you could have a script, like a PowerShell script that runs on the person's desktop that essentially just copies the file to the network folder, you know, names it according to the naming convention, and then pushes the old version into the archive folder, and then fills out a manifest log saying, you know, Neil Hepburn signed off on this particular extract. So that way, if anything goes wrong with a data refresh, this person is on, is on the hook, so to speak. So what does this actually look like, the data lake, the portable data lake system? Well, you can see here, I mean, I've already alluded to the, the data swamp here. So on the data column here, you have your data is either sitting in under a top-level data lake folder or a top-level data swamp folder. Uh, on the left here, you have both, um, you have your apps, and those can be consumer apps, which are your dashboards, and your producer apps, which is essentially just your ETL. In the middle here, you have what I call context or pedigree, and those are, as I mentioned earlier, the mashup rules, rollup rules, and data element details. And then on top of all that, you have a, actually that's, I'm really calling that a, gat, uh, I'm saying dictionary here, but it's really more like a catalog. So that's actually built bottom up from the data lake itself. We have a template folder, we have templates um, for, uh, for creating the folders and templates within the folders, like in Excel. So you fill out information around that data set and that is then compiled bottom up into a catalog, which can then be put into a, we have a dashboard that we can just explore that with. We have a data lake rule book. It's kind of like the Highway Traffic Act. Uh, we have a data lake guardian. Their job is to enforce the data lake rule book. And we have, this has not been implemented yet, but I would like to implement it, is a full text faceted search. So it's like, if you're looking through that needle in the haystack, you can do that. Um, you can try doing this in HDFS. I don't really recommend it. The problem with Hadoop is you, it is very business, there's, there's a, an impedance mismatch between business operating systems like Mac or Windows or even Linux like Ubuntu and Hadoop. Um, the reason is that the file system is distributed, so you have a name node and then you have data nodes and it's possible to be able to connect to one and not the other, so it's very low level. Things can go wrong very easily. Uh, Hadoop is a write forward only system. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to do anything that's, that's you know, reading, writing, um, it doesn't work very well. And um, thirdly, it doesn't like Excel. So you try putting Excel things into the data lake and you try to do any processing within the data lake within, I'm talking about Hadoop, by the way, and uh, you won't find any Excel drivers in Hadoop. So they don't like to even ingest Excel to begin with. Um, but if you do, you, the, the way you interact with HDFS is actually through not so much a data lake, but it would be through a tool, uh, through tables that you create through, through Hive, uh, or you can connect to them through Apache Drill. Uh, but again, th we have never implemented. This is a theoretical model. This is a real model, and this works really, really well. And by the way, this is, we're building this all out within PwC Canada, and I have built it all out within PwC Canada right now, except for that full text search engine. In fact, we just hired a full-time Data Lake Guardian. Uh, it was three of us playing that role up until about a month ago. So this is what it physically looks like um, right now. So as you can see, we're running everything with ClickSense as our, both our producer and consumer apps. Um, we have um, our data partitioned in various folders. You'll notice, by the way, that some folders will have this, this name T1 versus T2 versus T3. Um, T1 data sources are those that are from IT controlled systems. So that's from our CRM, from our billing system, and so on. And there's no human interaction there whatsoever. Then you have uh, T3 data sources, and that's really business control data. Those are all those little adjustment files or mapping tables or tracking sheets. And those are, um, uh, in some cases, they're actually reports extracted manually because that's the only way they can be obtained and then copied back into a, a T3 folder. And again, as I said, right now, we don't have a lot of controls around there uh, for the time being, but if you want to put, because we don't actually 
apart from that one report, there's not a lot of data that's changing there very often. Um, but we, we are moving towards putting more controls in there. So like I said, like a manifest would be signed off and that sort of thing. And then you have T2, which is anything derived from other T1, T2, or T3. And those T2 sources, by the way, can contain all the business logic you can possibly want. So when people are saying, well, how do I reproduce business logic that you've created? Well, you don't. You just make sure that that logic has been encoded into the data itself. So that way, if you've derived a new field, like the time on the phone and you've bucketed it by five minutes, that is a new extract. That's a new T2 set of partitions that can be joined with the original T1 set of partitions. Um, so um, what are the benefits uh, of all this data sets? Um, and metadata can be uh, it's faster and easier to obtain. Business users can upload stuff. They can contribute and share. They're players in this thing. They're on the open roads. Um, business users can also share apps even. Uh, and maybe not the business user themselves, but somebody working on their behalf. Um, business users can contribute to big data sets because everything's partitioned. And once you can do something on a single partition, then you can do it uh, trivially on all partitions. Um, and big data, for the most part, is cut off for most people. They don't know how to work with it. Um, there's no tool lock-in, if, especially if you try to keep something in a, as having one of those formats as either CSV or tab delimited. Some people are saying JSON is a good format. I don't think it's as mainstream yet. Um, when Excel can open it, then I'll say yes. Um, there's no, um, there's no lock-in, none. Um, and then you can validate, um, all of this stuff by business users without IT needing to get, get involved. So you can go in and you can check out all these rules. And, um, if you're ever, if you know anything about database archiving, it's basically you've solved the problem. Um, a guy by the name of Jack Olson has written a book on database archiving and it's still a major problem out there because most databases, if you just archive backups, you're not going to be able to read that data back unless you have that entire IT database to go along with it and the hardware to go with that database. So uh, this solves all of that. Um, so key takeaways, key takeaways, focus on getting user feedback sooner or later, get the uh, direct communication of technical resources to surface clarifying questions. Uh, reactively model until the third iteration, then take a break to refactor the data model. Emphasize portability of data, adjustments, metadata, uh, producer apps like ETL, and the, the consumer apps, which are the dashboards. And then consider taking a template approach to managing data in flat files and folders, and use the data lake system, and I'm hoping to put it on to uh, GitHub. Thank you very much. I know this went over a little bit over my time I was expecting, but I'm open for questions. Okay. Just bear with us for a second. Uh, How many people are online out of curiosity? I'll look at the report. So, uh, there's two ways we can do it. Let's, um, either those people can put your hand up or I can unmute everybody. So, uh, let me. Hmm? Okay. There's a question that's coming from the audience here, so uh, while we get you opened up here, how do I unmute you? Go ahead, ask your question. So the question I have is in the response to share or IT. Yes. The generation of Excel files that people are looking for to archive. Right. How does, uh, it's based on your experience, how does that help in addressing that requirement? <laughs> Yeah, so Shadow IT is, um, the reason Shadow IT exists is, is for the reasons that I gave earlier, the rigidity of um, the, the BI systems or the, the IT systems in general. So it's, it's, you know, it's given this kind of disparaging term, Shadow IT, like it's under the cover and, and, and it shouldn't be there and all that. Um, the, the, the way I, my philosophy around that is I see this approach um, as the least worst approach. So if you can get that data into a network shared folder, start with the data swamp. So if you remember that maturity diagram I showed you, if you can get them to surface it there, and by the way, all these folders I'm talking about, not all of them, but anyone, any of the ones that are, you know, not for everyone's eyes only, it's very easy to restrict access. You just right click on the folder and you restrict the access. In fact, I have a how-to guide that shows anyone how to do that. Um, to get it from the persons under the desk into the data swamp and then just immediately restrict it, you're already ahead of the game. 
because this is how I explain it to people. I say, it's much better if you think of, if you look at like the way um, you know uh, the war on drugs is being played out. People are realizing that these safe injection sites are actually lowering the spread of HIV. So a lot of people are disgusted by this, and and you know you can take a moralistic stance by that, but. Other people will say, well, this is the least worst situation. You're never going to have a great situation out of this. So this is the least worst situation. And that's how I portray this. Because people say, ah, but if you allow this to happen, then you're just going to make problems worse. And my point is, is that we've already bitten the apple. It's already happened. And to start with the data swamp, at least it creates the ability to share it. And, and at least it's allowed to be backed up. And you have a path towards the data lake. Now, eventually, where that same person can go, and they, they, they can, if they want to incorporate that data into um, a dashboard, and it could just be a departmental dashboard as well, by the way, um, they can put it into, as I said, they can, we can say, hey, I don't want you to throw away your Excel spreadsheet. I just want you to make sure you rename it so that it, it, it meets this naming convention. And in fact, I'll help you with a script, but we can even do it manually to get started, where you move the old version into an archive folder on the network drive, and you copy the current version to that um, you know, data lake folder, and you give it this name so that we know what's in that file. And you fill out some of this other information as well, this template over here. And um, if you do these things, and, and then finally, anytime you upload a new one, you, you, you add that to the manifest saying you signed off on that. So if anything goes wrong, we can come and talk to you. Now you brought that business user into the fold, and they can be, um, they're essentially a participant in the data lake. Now, they might decide, I have no interest in sharing any of this information beyond, the, you know, beyond my department. I'm just going to leave it in the swamp indefinitely. And I say, fine, you know, if that's what you want, then, and, and that makes sense for the business, then, then that's OK. Um, and, and if there's somebody else in the department who quickly wants the data, and, and it could be a large data set, it's just right click in the folder and providing access. And th the thing with NTFS is it doesn't take very much training to show someone how they can essentially become an administrator and own the folder. Because the nice thing about NTFS, you have these special permissions that you don't really have in other file systems. And one is called the take ownership permission, and the other is called the change permission permission. So you can just grant that to whoever. They can take ownership. And I mean, I did that for HR right now where we do our performance reviews every year and we get this balanced scorecard and in the past you know they were they, they didn't have time to go to it and build this data entry system it was too complex so they built a template in, in excel emailed it out and then people would fill it in and they'd email it back in and in the past they never really even processed these things these were numbers like performance ratings and they just had the partners go through and aggregate it on their own and now what we've said is that no you can just drop these all in a folder and um, because they all have the same template, we can write a load script that goes through and automatically aggregates all that stuff. So nobody had to change the template. All we did was really just tell people, um, make sure you name it like in this convention, and then make sure you drop it in here, and, and you're good. Now, um, the more controls you put on, the harder it'll be to make changes and whatnot, and that could potentially slow you down. So the other way, the other kind of analogy that I like to give people to think about, how do I build this thing out is going back to those open roads and highways. Imagine that you're in the middle of a cornfield and you're, the, you're a farmer and you've just set up the first house and you've just got you know, a dirt road with an intersection like this. Well, you don't really need to worry about putting up too much signage or governance at first because really nobody's going in there. And let's say a second person moves into your little hamlet and then one day as you're driving through the cornfield, you have a fender bender. OK, um, then you put in the four way stop sign and then, you know, no more fender benders. And then one day it just becomes really busy in there and you think, OK, I need to put in some traffic lights. And then over time, you think it's just too busy for that. And eventually you have a highway going through there. Right. But you're not going to build the highway from day one. But you have a nice sort of smooth path from the cornfield into the highway. And that's kind of how you have to think about this Excel stuff. How do you build that path? Any other questions? Yeah. If I understand mm -hmm. correctly, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the other, you could repeat that. Mm -hmm. Naming convention, now doing the data, so whoever is doing the more I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Oh, they can't. Uh, sorry, the volume is not. Uh, is it possible to turn up the mic volume here? The online can't hear folks me. can't hear you clearly. I think you may have to repeat. Um, you may have to repeat the question if you can. Sorry, well, I'll repeat the question again. Uh, well, can you hear me better now? 
I can hear you. I can't hear Bashir. Oh, sorry. It was just Bashir you couldn't hear. Okay, sorry. I, Bashir was just talking to me, so I think it's best if maybe you guys just ask the questions and I'll just repeat the question. Yeah, repeat the question because basically naming convention, understanding the business, uh, and therefore organizing the business. Mm -hmm. that. Okay. My question very quickly was that um, the naming convention, as Neil has uh, spoken about, therefore understanding the data, if a technology understands the business better, what the needs are kind of... Uh, but not just being a technologist, because they understand the business, the naming convention becomes very important from what you're talking about. Yeah. And therefore, how they organize the folders will make things much easier if they don't, uh, the, things get a little messy, correct? It's one of a scheme, exactly. And, and in fact, people are creating these schemes all the time on their own. They're constantly creating these schemes. And, 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 and they, they are sufficient, for the most part, for what they need to do. What, what most people don't have, which I have, is a background in, in data warehousing. So I know all the things that can happen over time that you want to account for. And that's why if you look at that naming convention, so getting the partition key, the as of timestamp in the file name, not relying on, those, on the windows to deal with that, because that can easily get um, tweaked. And then the schema version. Right, so, and then I understand also how information should be classified, you know, confidentiality, integrity, availability, retention, so. So I'm just doing something that everybody, I think a lot of business people have kind of figured out on their own, and I've just kind of figured out a more formal way of doing that. But that said, I, one thing I want to be clear about in this templating system, um, in some cases, if it's the same type of data and there's different workflows and, and, and so on involved, then you might want to tailor that templating system to whatever your need is. So the template system I have, by the way, if you look at it, it's got a, it's a big folder called PDLS, Portable Data Lake System. And underneath that, there's, there's actually five folders. Uh, I haven't talked about testing yet either and, and, and test ponds and all that. But, but um, you have Data Lake, Data Swamp, um, Data Lake Test, uh, Data Lake Apps, and Data Lake Context. And within there, there's templates. So within the Data Lake folder, there's a T1 template and a T2 template and a T3 template. And the idea is you just copy those templates for every time you have a data set. And then with it, within that, there's even templates for each table. So it's really, there's readme files and all the folders that kind of tell you what, how you should use it. But the idea is that you would just copy these, these templates and then sort of rename them according to the naming convention and just start slotting things in there. Now, if you have a certain type of workflow, you might want to create a different type of template that is more applicable to that workflow. Um, but that's really just the name of the game, is, is, is templates, naming conventions, I being smart about it. I've unmuted everybody who can remind them if they want to ask a question. Oh, everybody's unmuted, so if you want to ask a question, we should be able to hear I should be able to hear you. Uh, it's Sabina from Edmonton. Hi, Sabina. Okay. Uh, good evening from Edmonton. I'm uh, Sabina Posenjewski with Kips Alberta. Um, I thank you very much for this. Uh, the concepts of data lake and uh, data swamp are new to me. Hearing this tonight, and I'm okay. not sure if I'm missing a, a bit of context, further context, because it, it seems like. Um, the discussion has been around the access of more structured data. You talk about databases and so forth and being pulling from there. Correct. What yeah. about the unstructured world and especially with the trends now increasing towards electronic document and records management, so capturing, you know, sort of the unstructured files in a structured manner and being able to elicit the data from those types of sources based on this context you've presented. Does that make sense, my question? Like, it, do, it does make sense, and it's ultimately where everything makes sense to go in, and I think it's just more than people can digest right now. But yes, that is the ultimate um, way I like, that's how I like to see things go, and I, I manage a lot of my unstructured data in the data lake. Um, it comes down to, I think at this point, an appetite, because most people have been sold on something like SharePoint or some other document management system. Um, what I will say this about that is um, any unstructured data that pertains to the structured data in the data lake should be alongside the structured data. So if there's any documentation, PDFs, you name it, even heck video files if you want can be in the data lake. Um, if you, you know, in the Hadoop world, um, which I don't think really has as many business applications as people think, 
um, you know, people will put in video files and, and, and images and, and they'll be able to process it for, for facial recognition and so on and so forth. And that's a different sort of set of use cases. But um, yes, that's a file system. Anything that's a document can go in there. And I kind of feel it's the lowest common denominator and the most open thing that's out there. Um, everything else seems to be a little bit more like that railway system. So unless everybody is in the Hadoop system, then um, I look for the you know the lowest common denominator, which is right now the NTFS file system. So yes, you could build a um, a parallel system or even build out the data lake to be to fully embrace unstructured data, and that is to say unstructured data that has no structured counterpoint. So things like um, you know your initial job contract or any other contract for that matter. I think it could all go in there, but again, I um, I think there's 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 you know uh, I just don't know if the appetite is there yet, and 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 I also think too it's like it's hard to sell two massive sea changes at once, um, and I don't even know what the benefits. I, I would not be able to articulate the benefits around that because I don't work as much. I used to work with document management systems. I don't work as much with that stuff anymore, so it would be harder for me to articulate those benefits. So that's why I'm focused on the structured data. So I know that was a bit of a, a long answer. Did I answer your question? Yeah, no, no, that's good because I didn't know if I had missed you saying something or was this truly focused drawing from the structured environments that we can access. So that's all good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's more about the structured data. Did you have a question? Sorry, there's somebody in the room here that has a question. At this point, it's going into the situation. Oh. I'll repeat the question, by the way, for those on the phone. I'll just hear it first. Yeah, sorry. Yes. I'm not an auditor myself, by the way. I work in a completely different line of service, but anyway, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Well, I can tell you what I would recommend personally. I think that that's a highly loaded question. So to answer that, sort of repeat the question, um, uh, a gentleman in the room is asking, um, as PwC, since we are an auditor, what would we recommend? Should it be Informatica or MicroStrategy or SAP BW? And what would my recommendation be? Or what would PwC's recommendation be? Um, well, first of all, um, it would be the fact that we're an auditor is sort of incidental to this. I mean, I appreciate the um, the brand uh, halo effect that we get from that sort of trusted organization, and it is a big part of our brand. Um, and I do take it very seriously, by the way. Um, but but I would never recommend something just point blank um, without knowing what your current landscape looks like. So, if you're an SAP shop, I might recommend another SAP module if I thought that that was mature enough. Or if, if you're Greenfield, like you're just a new business, you have no BI, I might recommend something else. I'll tell you personally where, you know, how I, how, where I land on all these things. If it's my own money, Neil Hepburn, going out there, spending money on database, all that stuff. First thing I'm doing is I'm, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm setting up my portable data lake system, which is really just copying a folder structure into a network drive. And then I'm basically, um, I'm using uh, ClickSense or ClickView. Uh, these tools are bet your business tools. Um, I mean, there's really only three tools on the leader's quadrant right now on Gartner, as far as they're concerned. There's, um, there's Click, there's Tableau, and there's um, Power BI. And Click has the ability to write back data, so I can store CSVs, I can store QVDs. Power BI can't do that, so for me, that's a showstopper. And Tableau doesn't have an associated model, so that's a showstopper for me. So, um, uh, that's probably the answer you're looking for, I, I think. And, and uh, that's, again, if I had to spend my own money uh, and what I do at home, um, uh, you know, people who work with the Click after a while uh, can't stop using it because you can't really find a substitute that comes close. It's kind of addictive in, a, in, that, in that way, which is good and bad. Um, so anyway, I, did I answer your question? Great. Any other questions? Yeah, we're pretty late, aren't we? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll hand it back to Bashir. Thank
Thank you, Bashir. No, 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 not at all. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, um, I want to take this opportunity and uh, Neil here, I mean, you can stay in the picture, uh, has done a fantastic job. I think it was uh, very educational for uh, a lot of us, some of the approaches you talked about, and I can attest to that I've seen some of these challenges myself in the other side. Uh, in fact, both sides, and uh, I think you did a super job. So, you know, in the objective that we had, that we want to continue to bring you people who actually understand, have the expertise, as you can quite uh, uh, easily see as Neil was going through that. He knows what he's talking about, got pretty good background and did a, I think, fantastic job. I like the fact that you actually backed up with some of the like case studies and, and stories of exactly how it happened because it makes it very, very easy to understand and link to the issues. So I thought that was pretty powerful. So I have no doubt that uh, uh, people will taken some stuff away from me. If you have any questions that we couldn't answer today, I apologize that we went over, but we didn't want to stop because it was very useful information. Um, please flip an email. We'll get it to Neil and hopefully get you an answer. But uh, on behalf of Canadian Information Processing Society, we want to thank you very much for doing a super job. Sure. Uh, and I'm sure people, as they see the presentation, all those who attended will get to see the presentation. So in case you were rushing to write notes and didn't or made notes, you'll be able to see that because we'll put it up on Kip's website as well. So thank you very much for taking some valuable time out of your uh, evening. Thank God there's no Raptors game. <laughs> so oh, we were able to do this better. But uh, we look forward to continuing to bring this. And once again, a very big thank, uh, thank you to uh, Neil for doing a fantastic job. So thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, so take care, all the best, and good night to each and every one of you, and drive safe if you're outside. Okay. So this should have, why is it, don't tell me. Thank <laughs> you.